morning. Welcome to our 9 o'clock worship here at Washington Street. Good morning and welcome to our 9 o'clock worship here at Washington Street. Thank you for being with us as we have come together this morning to praise God as a family. So much excitement when the body of believers comes together. Something tells me you can't hear me. I don't know. Y'all can hear me. Okay, I'm not sure. Well, good morning if you didn't hear me earlier. <laughs> It's great to be together for an hour of worship. Thank you for being here. I hope you have one of the handouts this morning. We've got uh, the order of worship on the front, but even more importantly, tons and tons of news and announcements inside that you'll want to be aware of both today and throughout the week and the month ahead uh, as you stay uh, active in the body of Christ as uh, in serving others. If you have not filled out an attendance card, I encourage you to do that. Pass it to one of the aisles. I'll have some gentlemen pick those up in just a few moments. Uh, an exciting day. Every first day of the week is an exciting day. Um, uh, I'm not going to embarrass them by making them stand up, but if you'll indulge me just a moment, our son Travis, who many of you have known since birth, uh, is, uh, is back with us this morning after three years and seven months in Nicaragua working at... Uh, Katie Beth Carter Institute, a memorial institute, a Christian school in the little village of Thomas Borges uh, near Lyon, Nicaragua, and uh, they flew home. Uh, he actually, he left, uh, I'll never forget dropping him at the Atlanta airport. He had one bag, check bag, and one backpack, and he returned Thursday with uh, Kathy, his wife, and Luna, their dog, and so... <laughs> So a uh, very busy young family that returned to Tennessee. They're going to be moving to Chattanooga. Uh, many of you have prayed for them over the last uh, several years for safety and success in their work. Uh, their uh, students at the school were uh, very sad to see Travis and Kathy leave uh, after the work they've done there, but lots of, uh, lots of blessings. God is good. He has opened up so many doors for them here in in Tennessee. They're going to be moving to Chattanooga and beginning work there. And uh, we just are excited to see how God is going to use them um, in, uh, in Tennessee now that he, uh, they, they completed the major part of their work. They'll be going back to see family, Kathy's families in Costa Rica and Nicaragua and uh, other places in Central America. So we, uh, we know they'll be back and forth, but uh, they're excited to start this new chapter in life. We thank God for his blessings on their, their ministry there and what they'll be doing here in Tennessee. What a blessing. If you'd like to, let's stand as we begin our worship. There is beyond the answer blue a dark and superhuman sign. He did his God's heavenly Yeah. 
Would you bow in, please? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us a peaceful night's rest and for being here in your presence this morning to honor you and to praise you as the worship service. We hope and pray that our everyday thoughts and concerns are gone from our minds this morning as we focus our attention on you. As we worship you, as we praise you, as we sing songs of praise to you, to you and, and learn from our Bible lessons that we can focus on you and that everything that we can do this morning will be acceptable and pleasing to you. Father, we're thankful for this great nation we live in, the freedoms that we have, the blessings that you've given us. Every day, we are mindful that you are our God, you are our creator, all good things come from you. And we're thankful for that, we're thankful for the avenue of prayer, Lord, that we can come before you to not only offer you thanksgiving for everything you've done for us, but also to beseech you for strength, for courage, for tenacity against the evil one. Father, we know that there's evil all around us every day. We fight that evil. We know there's sin in our hearts every day. We know that we're human. We know that we make mistakes, but we can always come to you and rely on that grace, rely on that forgiveness. Our hearts also go out to others who have wronged us, others who <coughs> look upon us very kindly, others who do not understand our faith in you. They don't understand the lives that we live every day in support of you in our lifestyle as we strive to be with you in our hearts and in our minds. Father, thank you for everything. Thank you for the word. Thank you for the word that we read every day that we know we can draw closer to you and the Holy Spirit can live in our hearts. Father, this time we are mindful of those that are in need of help. Many of those out there that are hurting one way or another whether they're physically hurting or mentally, mentally or emotionally hurting. Father, we know, know that you are with them. May we take the time and the effort to also be with them, to minister to them, as you have asked us to do, and also to be mindful of those always that are less fortunate than we are. Forgive us, Father, when we sin against you. Be with us always. It's our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs>
This is a time of worship where we partake of the Lord's Supper as we remember his pain and suffering. Uh, last week I talked about the pain he bore on his back and shoulders. This week I want to talk about his mental anguish and pain that he went through. I'm going to use three scriptures to do that. Luke 19, verse 41. In Luke 19, verse 41. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known that this day what it would bring what it would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. So Jesus was already weeping over the city of Jerusalem as he came into it because his people had abandoned him. As a matter of fact, in verse 44 they said he he knew Jerusalem would be destroyed. He said they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And then verse 22, or Luke chapter 22, verse 42. Father, this is Jesus' prayer in the garden. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. And the angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, this was before his arrest or anything. He was already in anguish, a mental and emotional anguish. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Not only that, but he took on our sin, which is a burden I can't even imagine. So as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let's remember not only his physical suffering, but his mental and emotional suffering that he went for us because of his love. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, as we partake of this bread, Father, help us to remember his body that was put through so much torture for us and uh, the mental and emotional anguish that he went through. Help us to partake of this in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>
Would you pray with me again? Our Father in heaven, as we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to remember Jesus' blood that was shed for our forgiveness. Help us to partake of this in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray.
Bible, go ahead and open, open it to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. I want to read the first five verses of Psalm 27. Verse 4 is where we find our fifth one thing. We've looked at these, and uh, this is the last uh, of the little phrases that we find in Scripture that have the wording one thing. And in verse 4, we uh, we'll find that again, and we will talk about overcoming self. So let's read this together. Psalm 27, beginning with verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, my, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Now let's just stop right there for one moment. I want you to think about the challenges for David as king. There are numerous challenges for David as king. There are a lot of foes out there for David as well. Even some within the kingdom. And probably those in the kingdom were some of his greatest. And so David had enemies on all sides. And here he is making a, a declarative statement. I'm not going to be afraid of anyone. I'm not going to worry about my life. Why? Because God is the caretaker of me. He says, When the wicked came against me to eat, my, eat up my flesh, my enemies and, and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp, uh, may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, 
In this I will be confident. Now here it is, verse 4. One thing I have desired. Now think about all that David's experiencing in his life. All of the challenges, all of the daily battles. Even trying to overcome himself. David says, the one thing I desire of the Lord that I will seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Now think about the confidence David had in God. Think about the desire of David's heart. And let's talk a little bit about that this morning. If we want to develop a life where we overcome ourselves, you know, we are our own worst enemy. Uh, without a doubt, we're, we're, uh, we are our biggest challenge. And David, David is recognizing this. And no, no doubt he realistically looks at all of the things that he is facing in life, the, the people that would come against him with war, even those within the kingdom, his foes. He still understands that he's got one thing he needs to focus on. And I mentioned this when we started this series. You know, I think life gets so complicated for us, doesn't it? We, we, we start to think about everything else. We start to look at every little thing, every little detail. And, and it, it can consume us. And I think God, in a very real sense, is trying to get us to just slow down. Get us to slow down and think about one thing. And in this particular context, as we're learning from David, that one thing is to have a desire for God. And in order to do that, we have to overcome ourselves. We must develop a life focused on the beauty of God, a life that seeks the will of God, not, not only to know it, but also to, to do it, right? A, a life that is completely consumed in Him, consumed with Him, and consumed for Him. We need that kind of life. Now let me ask you, do you have that kind of life this morning? Is your life completely consumed with our great God? You know, I know we're consumed with a lot of things. I mean, I know what many of us were thinking about. I guess I have to say this morning, go Vols, right? I know what a lot of people were thinking about yesterday. I know what I was thinking about yesterday. And we're consumed with a lot of things in life. But what's God trying to get us to slow down and think about? Him. You know, in a very real sense, again, we have to take ourselves out of the picture. If we can just remove self, if we can think about just a, a complete desire, a complete focus, a complete love and fervor for God, and not think about the physical aspect of our lives, because that's what we're consumed with a lot. We're consumed with the physical aspect of this life. Will I have a better job? Will I have more money? Will I be here? Will I be there? What about my health? What about my friend's health or my family's health? What about this? Dot, 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 you fill in the blank. We are consumed with a lot of things in this life, most of which are physical. And our physical side is waging war with our spiritual side. And while that's a difficult concept in and of itself, it's pretty simple to know that there's a battle going on. We don't have to understand all everything about the battle. We just need to know what's going on and whose side we're on. I want you to think about this this morning for just a moment. If you could ask God one thing, make one request of him, it's kind of like rubbing the genie's lamp, right? If you could just, if you, God, here it is. This is one thing I'm going to ask you and you're going to provide. What would that thing be for you? What would you ask God? God, I would like dot, 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 fill in the blank. This, that. I think most of us, if we're thinking honestly, we're going to say we would like, and it would be something material, something physical. We, we might even ask God to heal someone uh, in the flesh, in their physical body. I think that's honest, and I think that's true of most of us, right? I mean, in, in some way, we would just say, God, if you would make it easier for me to have a better job, be in a better place, 
God, if you would make it easier for me to have better health. I think a lot of us would ask that. One of the things I love about Psalm 27, and especially verse 4, is we get to peek inside David's heart. And I'm not saying David is a perfect man. I think David is a great example for us, for you and me, to know that, that even the people who God considered were individuals after his own heart failed miserably at times. I think there's hope for you and me. But we get to peek inside of his heart. And, and what was that thing that David asked? That one thing. God, I want to ask you, I, I, I want you to fulfill this request of mine. Here it is. And his was just to be with you, Lord. I, I want nothing but you. I, I want to think about you. I want you. I want your love. You are who I need. You are what I want. You are my sustainer. You are my salvation. I love what C.S. Lewis wrote. He said, I want God. Now, the second part of this is really interesting. I want God. Not my idea of God. Right? I, I, think, I think sometimes the way, you know, when we think about God, we want God, but we want Him on our terms, right? God, I want you, but I want to live my own life. God, I need you to be my Savior, not so sure about being Lord and directing my steps and following your will. Because there are moments when my will and your will might not line up and I want what's good for me. So I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. And I think this should be the desire for every one of us. We want God, not our idea of God, and I'm not saying your idea of God's bad. But we just want God. Period. And I think that's what C.S. Lewis is saying. I love the way Paul uh, worded it. In Philippians chapter 3, beginning with verse 8, he says, Yet indeed I count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, the righteousness which is from God by faith. That Verse 10, I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death, if by any means I might attain the resurrection of the dead. Here's the Apostle Paul saying very much the same thing that David said. God, uh, God, when I look at everything, and he's even telling the church at Philippi this in written form, when I look at everything out there, the one thing I want more than anything else is you. I, I want to know Jesus Christ. I want to know everything about him. I, I want to know his love. I want to know the height and the width and the depth. I, I want to know uh, about Everything concerning his life. I, I want to be so close to him that when people see me, they see him. Jesus kind of answers it in a similar way in Matthew 22, verse 37. Now, the context is a little different than what we're thinking of with uh, Philippians 3 and Psalm 27. But here they ask Jesus by what authority he's doing the things that he's doing. And he ends, and then they end up getting into a discussion about, well, well, what's the greatest command in all the law? And that was an easy one for Jesus to answer because this is something he would quote twice every day in the morning and at night. Now, again, he's quoting um, from the Old Testament. But in Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now get this. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Should this be our desire as well? I mean, and is, this, is this what Jesus is telling us? You want to bowl it down? Right here it is. Now, some people misunderstand this verse in, a, in the sense that they say, well, all we have to do is love, that we don't really have to follow Scripture. It's just about love. And, and that's not what Jesus is saying here. 
Jesus is saying, when you look at all the laws, which, by the way, he was supposed to keep, as well as the people who lived under that system were supposed to keep. When you look at all of them, aren't they all really boiled down to the fact that if we truly love God, we're going to do what he says? And if we truly love people, we're going to love people the way that he says? In a sense, all of the law and the prophets do hang on these two commandments. I mean, for example, let me give you a case in point. When God says, do not murder, was it just because God said it that they shouldn't do it? Or was, was it because if we love God and we love people, we're not going to take the life of another human being? God says, don't steal. Is it wrong to steal just because the Bible says don't steal? Not necessarily. It, it, it would be wrong because God said it. But what's the, what's the weightier matter of the law behind that? Well, if you love your neighbors yourself, you're not going to take your neighbor's stuff. You're not going to take your neighbor's wife. You're not going to lie to your neighbor. Why? Because God has your neighbor in his best interest as well. And so God's telling these people, listen, I want, you to, I want you to love me, and I want you to love people, and really, that's how it's all summed up. But that's the motive behind the commandments. That's the motive behind the law. And again, our desire should be for God. It should be for His presence, His beauty, His house. I want, think about it for a moment. What, what are you and I showing to the world when they watch us? When they, they see what we're involved in, when they hear how we talk and act, what are, what are they really seeing when they, they look at our life? Are, are they seeing that our one desire is for God and that that factors into how we function and, and uh, live among people? Again, over and over and over, the Bible tells us in the Old Testament and the New Love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love neighbors uh, as ourselves. Now, Jesus changed that dynamic in John 13, 34, and 35. Said, a new commandment I give to you. Right? And, and now we're to love our neighbor not as ourselves. How are we to love our neighbor? The way Jesus loves our neighbor. That's why it's a new commandment. And so this desire for God, this desire for loving him, should be at the, fir at the forefront of our minds. And again, I, I would say that what's true of David is also true of you and me, that he was his own worst enemy. But we must overcome ourselves in order to live and love and desire God and God alone. So how do we do that? Just real quick, how do we do that this morning? Let's focus on a couple of things from our text that might be helpful for us this morning. Uh, number one, look to God alone. Uh, again, we have so many distractions in life. There are so many things that are competing for our attention, for our time, for our resources, for our love even. And God has to be the very thing that we're focused on. He consumes us. He consumes our minds. He consumes our hearts, our lives. He's the reason for the way that we live. I think we think about God as a means to an end. Meaning, God, I want you to do this, and the end result is blessing for me. Which is, I think in a very real sense, not the way that our hearts are supposed to be, right? We don't just, God's not the proverbial Santa Claus sitting up there, waiting, us, waiting on us for, to come up and sit on his lap and to share a few requests and, and uh, hoping hoping that he will just honor that request. That's not how God is. I, I, I've used this illustration before. I don't know if I've used this here or not. And I won't mention names because it's close to our family. We have a family member that um, has been in a lot of trouble through the years. I know many of you understand what that's like. And this particular family member, um, every time he calls his mother, the phone rings at his mother's home, generally... It's not good. You know, some things, mom, can you bail me out? Mom, can you help pick me up? Mom, can you dot, dot, dot? And it's just over and over. And that's the life. And, and, and I, you know, instead of getting a call saying, mom, I love you. Mom, I'm thankful for you. Mom, thank you for picking me up. Thank you for 
what you did for me. Thank you for the life that you've given to me. Instead of that, it's always a request. And, and I wonder if when we approach God, we just thank God for His greatness, for His beauty, for His majesty. Like He's not a means to an end for us to get what we want, to get a better house, to get a better job, to get a better car, to have a better relationship. God's not a means to an end. And, and again, that's not the way that our hearts are supposed to be. Our hearts are, are, are made to look to God and God alone. And not as a means to an end, but to God as the end. He's the end for you and for me. And I think in some ways Psalm 24 expresses that. My desire is for you, Lord. That's This one thing that I desire, I, I desire you above all else. Above, above all the prosperity, David would say. Above all the power in the kingdom. Above all the prestige that that brings. Above all that, the one thing that I want more than anything is you. And I think if we could train our minds and our hearts to focus in that way, we will overcome ourselves. But we're tempted. Again, we're tempted to see God as useful and not beautiful. And what I mean by that, useful to get what we want. Useful to honor a request. Useful to put us in a better position. And not just simply beautiful. Just that He is the glory that we are focusing on in our life. Do you want God alone? When you think about what He's done for you, is He sufficient? Is He enough? And, and whether David honored this with the rest of his life or not, not my... Uh, uh, Point to make here this morning. David obviously made some serious mistakes, and there were moments when he took his focus off God. But nonetheless, he understood this is where it should be, and this should be the focus of his heart. I want you to think about this. Number two, in the end, there's only God. I don't know if we if we think about that enough. That in the end, there's only God. You know, the the picture in Revelation 22. In verse 4 is that when we finally get there, we get to see God. You know, I, I've made mention of this before, and I know some of you have thought about this as well, that, you know, we, we think about why we want to go to heaven, right? Why, why we want to go to heaven. I mean, every one of us want to get there. We want to get out of this life filled with sickness and sorrow and separation and heartbreak. We, 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 we long to be in heaven. But why? Well, I don't want to go to hell, that some might say. Which is, I mean, honestly, I don't want to go there either. I want to go to heaven. But shouldn't the reason that we desire heaven, shouldn't it be God? We want to be in heaven because that's where God is. That's where His home is. We long to be there because, because we want to shed this physical body and we want to be spiritually in His presence forever. Where again, there is no more, and, and you can fill in the blank there. When we think about it, when this world is finally over, when, when Jesus comes back and he closes the curtains of this world, what's left? What will be left? <laughs> think about that for a moment. Second Peter chapter 3, let's see if we can find an answer. Beginning in verse 1, he says... Beloved, I write to you this second epistle. Now, now get this. He wanted to remind them, both to re stir up uh, in your pure minds by way of reminder, something he had already talked to them about. That you, may, uh, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets and the commandment uh, of us, the apostles of the Lord and the Savior. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in last days, walking according to their own lusts, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world then existed, perished, being flooded with water." Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Beloved, do not forget this one thing. With the, the Lord, 
One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the uh, elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in them will be burned up. When, when the end comes, what's left? Only God. Only God. In Luke chapter 12, verse 16, you remember through verse 21, I, I won't take time to, remember, uh, to read this, but you know the story of the rich farmer who you know, was going to tear down his barns and build bigger barns and all of that. Do you remember... The end result of that story in verse 20. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose things, uh, who will those things uh, be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Focus on God. Put your treasure there. He's all that's going to uh, make it in the end. He's the only thing that will last in the end. And I think that in order to overcome... We have to say, you know what? Our focus is not on the madness of materialism. That was two sermons ago, remember? Right? Our focus is not on ourselves. And, and that, that we can get more. No, our focus is on God. I think our prayer needs to be, God forgive us for having divided hearts. I think sometimes we, our loyalty is divided. And, and, and it should be uh, focused solely on God. But I think so many times, so much, so many other things come and get the best of us. And I hope that God will make us be a people who will just find Him, seek His beauty, long to do His will, long for His house. Finally, the way that He started in verse 4, right? One thing I desire. What was it? He, he desired God, but He wanted to be with God. I can tell you, and I know, I know many of you know this is true. Now, some of you live close to, the, to where you've lived your whole life. And that's not true for a lot of us. It's really far for some of us, right? But I want you to think about this. We long for home. We long to go back, and we long to be uh, in, in the place that we love and, and the people with the people that we love. We, we long for that. You know, there's, there's not a better thought than, than being back with those familiar people in that familiar place with those familiar experiences. Nothing like it. And I think that's the way it should be with God's house. You know, we, we want to be with the people that love God too. We, 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 we want to be with the people that, that, that celebrate the, the glory of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he gave at Calvary. And that's Psalm 24. David's saying, out of all the places, I desire you and I desire your house more than any other place in this life. I think so many times we're focused on the circumstances or we're wanting to be somewhere different and, and God's trying to pull us back. He's trying to capture our hearts once again to be, all, be in love with him all over again. That, that was the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Of all the places they should have been longing for and loving was Jesus and his house. But it wasn't. You remember how Psalm 23 ends? It's one of the most famous passages that people remember and take a lot of comfort in. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and help me out. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, this wasn't just a one-time thing with David. And again, I'm not saying he's perfect, but this captured his heart. As a matter of fact, he says something very similar in Psalm 145, verse 5. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Being around God, being consumed with God, looking at what God has made, looking at how God has blessed us, this was the focus of his heart. But I want you to also understand that Jesus created a house, a place on this side of eternity. That place is the church. 
I will tell you that our desire should be for the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should love it. We should love the people who make it up. We should have a desire to be with those people when worship is happening. We should have a desire to, to long for fellowship with God's people. This ought to be the place that brings you back to that moment where you say, this is where I belong. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then he told the apostles, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I'm going to build my church, then I'm going to give you the keys to it, the kingdom. The church is the kingdom of our Lord, where he reigns supreme as king. Let me fi final, finally just kind of close this point by saying this. And I, I, this could be a whole sermon itself. And I'll not make it such. You'll appreciate that. But, but if, if you don't long for his house here, you, you might, might not make it to his house there. Uh, we need to hear that. I, I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad this morning. Please don't misunderstand me. I am thankful you are here. And God loves the fact that you are here. That you are worshiping Him. But if you can't focus on His house here, we might not make it to His house there. David said, I can't wait to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But that community was so important to his life then, and it should be important to our lives now. You know, as we kind of close this out, I want us to think about this. It's just an interesting thought from verse 4. Not to make a whole other point, but just to kind of close this up. I think it's interesting that in verse 4, he talks in, the future, in a future tense, I will seek. Uh, and then he talks in past tense, I have asked. Isn't that interesting? David has asked, but then he's also going to seek. He's asked in the past, but he's going to seek in the future. Isn't that so practical? We're going we're gonna to pour our hearts out because we desire God. Isn't that so practical? Nothing brings greater peace to the troubled soul than to meditate on God and His greatness and His love and His salvation. Isn't that it? Nothing puts life and its complete, uh, competing pleasures in greater spiritual perspective than a knowledge of the surpassing greatness of God and His love how high, how wide, how deep. Nothing does that greater than focusing on God. Nothing empowers the will to make harder choices, at times even painful choices, to forego the passing pleasure of sin than does a view of the splendor and glory of God. And we get to see in David's heart, that's what he longed for. Now, the beautiful thing about this, the way that we will close this up, is the past and the future, you know what links those two? Right now. It's, it's what links the past and the future. What you do with God right now matters. Where is your heart? Where is your loyalty and your allegiance to God? Are you completely sold out to Him? Mark's going to lead us in a song. We do it every single time we meet. And, and the purpose of that song is for us to praise God, yes, but also give an opportunity for, for sincere and pure souls to step out in faith and, and to think about God and His greatness and to accept His goodness, His mercy, and His salvation. You know, I, I know I often tease about having an upper church and a lower church. You know, the upper church is up there. They're just looking down on all of us. And it's great, but we're one church, right? If you need to upstairs to walk this aisle, then you make your way to those stairs, and you come here this morning. You, you need to make your heart right with God. Do not leave here this morning without God being your sole desire. The beautiful thing about David, the one who wrote that particular song, also made a lot of mistakes. 
And he asked God, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Maybe that's your prayer this morning. If it's to accept Jesus and to be immersed in his grace, then we want to help you in that response as well. As together we stand. And as we stand. I want to announce that Billy and Susie, uh, Susan Murphy uh, have placed membership with us. Now, Susan is here. I, I made a mistake last week. I was supposed to do this last week, and then when Mila responded, I, I completely uh, got uh, off uh, of my game last week. But uh, Billy has to work every other week, and so he's not here today. But uh, Susan is here in the back. Susan, if you just raise your hand. She's in the back. Y'all welcome uh, our new sister to our family. And, uh, of course, next week you can welcome Billy and their two daughters. I meant their two children, not two daughters. I'm just making a mess of this. We're grateful that you're here, Murphy family. How about that? Good morning. We are glad that you're here with us. As we have said already today, we hope that uh, our services have been a blessing to you and that they can help you go out into the world and share the gospel in a more effective way. Um, our announcements for today are Ann Bedingfield is at home sick with COVID. Uh, Kent Kilpatrick is recovering from knee surgery. I don't see him here. So uh, the last I heard from him, he was doing really well, but he was having some pain. And so uh, keep him in your prayers. Gene Ward was dismissed to Lincoln Manor. And of course, our family here suppresses, uh, uh, expresses excuse me, our sympathy to the family of Kurt Bartelt, follower of Grant Bartelt, uh, he passed away this past Tuesday on September 5th, so please keep Grant in, and family in your prayers. Uh, also, congratulations are offered to Harlan uh, Allen Pierce, born September 6th, 
to Dale and Jen Pierce and big sister Winnie. He weighed in at six pounds, six ounces and 19 and a half inches tall. Proud grandparents are Ricky and Sarah Jo Pierce, so congratulations to them. And of course, we don't do a whole lot of just general announcements, but one thing that we did want to mention, we're a little late to the game with our Magi Fox program. Anybody remember this program from years past? Um, we are going to participate in this, but it is due at the end of this month by Sunday the 24th. If you could pick these boxes up, they are in the gymnasium or the fellowship hall at this time. We will have more later this week, probably by Wednesday. Uh, we've talked to Jim about bringing some more back to us. Um, but we would love to see every person pick up a box, but we'd especially love to see every family pick up one of these boxes. They are a great service that um, we have done year after year after year. Uh, I know that the kids, uh, especially my kids, have enjoyed doing them. I hope that you guys enjoy doing them well. But please pick up a box or five and uh, take them. The list is on the website. I posted it to Facebook this morning, and we will have these. Uh, for you as well. We do not have them this morning. I apologize. I was a little bit late to the game on getting that <laughs> done. Uh, but we are glad and hopefully that you will pick that up. Uh, they will be due again the 24th. And there is a per box shipping charge. Please remember that uh, you can make checks to the church uh, for $8 a box and just put them in the box and we will collect them before we ship those out and write one big check. And so uh, please pick up a box and bless those children with that donation. Uh, if you will bow with me, we'll come to a close. Lord, we come to you today, we come to honor, glorify, and praise you in all that we do. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity this morning to gather in your name, uh, sing songs, praises, and prayer, uh, hear a message from your word. Lord, we ask that you help us to take what we have heard today, uh, and even just the, the feeling of the worship and the fellowship. We ask you to take, help us take that into this day and in through this week, Lord, and that we can build upon that and use that to serve you, to spread your gospel and to love each other. In all things, Lord, we ask that you be with those that we've mentioned today that are struggling and that are sick. Be with those especially who have unmentioned prayers. Uh, give wisdom, guidance, and healing to all these situations. Lord, be with us as we go throughout the week. Bring us back safely in our next time. And in your sin's name we pray. Pray. Amen.